Welcome, everybody. Um, if, if everyone could uh, go ahead and kind of move to their seats, uh, that would be great. Um, I want to welcome ev everyone. I'm David Smith. I'm the chair of the LBJ Future Forum. And on behalf of uh, me and our honorary uh, uh, founding chair, Catherine Robb, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, LBJ uh, Library. Um, I am particularly excited about the event we have tonight. And uh, thank you all uh, very much for joining us because we're uh, in for a real treat. We have collectively over a, because I counted it up, over a century of uh, uh, history and reporting <laughs> on, 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 on Texas uh, uh, politics on the stage. Um, and, and most of that's Erica, so, uh, ironically enough. But um, uh, from left to right, we have uh, Erica Greeter, um, Erica, senior editor of Texas Monthly. Uh, she was formerly a correspondent with The Economist um, and is the author of the recently published uh, book, Big Hot, Cheap, and Right, which is a, a terrific book. Um, one thing I will say about Erica is I have a lot of friends on the far right, a lot of friends on the far left, and they are all convinced that Erica is a sympathizer with the other side, <laughs> which is an indication to me that I think she does it right and does a really good job. And if any of y'all are on Twitter, follow her on Twitter because she is a hoot. Um, <laughs> next, we have uh, uh, Harvey Kronberg. Um, Harvey is um, is the owner and editor of the uh, the Corn Report, um, which is uh, probably about the, the longest running uh, 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 capital uh, inside politics uh, newsletter uh, out there and uh, is one of those guys where I've been uh, been reading and following since I was a, uh, a much younger staffer at the Texas Capitol. Um, next we have uh, Paul Burka, um, who probably needs an introduction. Paul's the, uh, the dean, um, I think, of the uh, Texas uh, political um, uh, correspondent and, and reporter uh, uh, community. Um, has been covering the, uh, the Texas Capitol, Texas politics for Texas Monthly for 40 years and has done an outstanding, outstanding job of it. Um, and finally, we have, uh, we have a, 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 I'm sorry to say, a friend of mine, uh, Ross <laughs> Ramsey, uh, who uh, is editor and co-founder of the always uh, terrific Texas Tribune, um, formerly was the, uh, the editor of the Texas Weekly, and I will tell a, a quick story. Um, when Ross was editor of Texas Weekly and, uh, and Harvey was editor of the Quorum Report, um, they were both, uh, they're both weeklies, um, and, or, or semi-weeklies during, during the session. And, and as, a, as a young capital staffer, we would go, back when it was printed and we delivered to your office, we would all go to see if, if either us or any of our friends were mentioned by name in either uh, the, the uh, uh, Texas Weekly or in the Quorum Report because you knew if you were mentioned by name in either one of those publications, you had actually made it in, in Texas politics. And then I got to know Ross quite well after, and the last thing in the world I wanted to have happen was to be mentioned by name. Um, having said that, uh, uh, I want to hand it over to, to Erica, who is going to uh, uh, very capably moderate. I want to uh, encourage you guys to stick around after we will have uh, a reception with an open bar uh, for an hour. I've asked each one of these folks and they have agreed uh, to stick around after for uh, as long as they possibly can uh, to, to visit um, and entertain more questions and uh, uh, enjoy some good uh, future forum uh, discussion and camaraderie. So thank you all for being here. Erica, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, my guests, for being here. Um, guys, brace yourselves. We've got a lot to cover in the next 45 minutes because I'm not going to go past 7.30. I want us all to take a break. Um, I thought I would start by just setting the stage a bit. I'm sure in this kind of crowd, the LJ Future Forum, uh, most of you have been following the political news, and so you might um, already know all this. But when we were putting this panel together, we thought, well, is this panel, is this election this year, are we going to see a lot of change in Texas politics? Um, on the one hand, I don't want to ruin any suspense, but it's probable that after this election, we'll still have Republicans in every top office in the state. Um, there are some Democrats contesting pretty hard right now, but it, we haven't sent a Democrat to statewide executive office for 20 years. 94 is the last time, so that seems like at the moment still a fair bet. Um, in that sense, we'll see not very much political change in Texas after these elections. 
However, we are seeing what, for this state, for modern Texas politics, is a ton of change because we have at least five, possibly all six, of the top statewide executive offices changing hands. The reason for that is that Governor Perry, who you all know, the governor of Texas, longest serving governor in state history, is not running for re-election. Um, Greg Abbott, the Attorney General, is not running for re-election as AG because he's running to replace Perry as governor. Susan Combs, the Comptroller, not running for re-election. Um, Todd Staples, the Ag Commissioner, not running for re-election because he's running against, uh, running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Jerry Patterson, Land Commissioner, also running for Lieutenant Governor in the primary. David Dewhurst, the incumbent Lieutenant Governor, is running for re-election. Uh, he's the only one running for re-election through his current job. Um, and he might prevail. I think he, I think I would guess that he probably will uh, in the end, probably after a runoff. But we'll see five new faces in those top jobs. In addition to all that, sorry, it's kind of a marathon rundown of these races. Um, we have a kind of visible Senate primary with John Cornyn being challenged by the Tea Party type Congressman Steve Stockman from Houston. And we have a lot of down ballot races in turmoil, partly because of all the people who are vying to, for higher office now. There's vacancies created at the legislative level. Partly it's because of this trend where Tea Partiers primary challenge incumbent Republicans. Um, but it adds up to quite a bit of uh, excitement and drama and intrigue um, and really just some excellent worthy policy debates that we've, we've seen so far. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to start by asking all three of these guys, my esteemed colleagues, for their kind of big picture take. I've covered a few Texas primaries, but you've all covered more than I have. So um, looking at the Republican primary, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's going on with these guys? Let me start? Yes, please do. At, at the very, um... <laughs> We haven't, we haven't seen any contests at the top of the ticket, uh, and eat, frankly, in either, either party for a long time. I was thinking that uh, the melodrama in the governor's uh, race, uh, the last time we saw anything this exciting was Jim Maddox and, and Ann Richards. Jim Maddox uh, accused her of using cocaine. She called him a junkyard dog, and we went off from there. So uh, it was, uh, uh, when we think it's a race to the bottom now, we should remember that uh, now we're actually fairly professional at racing to the bottom. Um, <laughs> But the macro picture has been, for the last three or four elections, has been Tea Party versus Chamber of Commerce. And what has mystified me to some degree while watching all this is that the Tea Party has not been particularly successful, but it has been persistent and it has been passionate. Uh, the smaller the legislative district or the smaller the, the, the jurisdiction, house races, for instance, the more successful Chamber of Commerce type candidates seem to be. The bigger the jurisdiction, i.e. the Senate or the Congress, uh, the more successful the Tea Party types seem to be. And when you look at these races, these statewide races, they must all see the same polling that makes them believe that, that you can't win without satisfying the Tea Party. I'm not sure that that's going to prove to be true. I, ultimately, um, uh, Erica has made the, the assumption that, that this will continue to be a Republican state, but, uh, uh, or at least the, all the, the statewide will continue to be Republican. But if uh, Wendy Davis gets up into 47, 48, 49 percent, then we see Hillary parachute into, into South Texas and galvanize Hispanic vote, um, uh, it, it will be a game changer. And, and it, they don't have to win to succeed. Paul, what would you add? Well, I think the, <clears throat> this, this uh, uh, other notion of what's going on here is the so-called Republican Civil War, uh, which is uh, being led by uh, conservatives uh, uh, and uh, uh, trying to drive out uh, the moderates from, from the Republican Party. And uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, the perpetual speaker's race, uh, races that we've had over the last few years, and it'll, it'll continue as long as Joe Strauss is speaking, uh, because the conservatives, uh, one of the things that they are up to in this election uh, is to try to defeat uh, the strong supporters of Strauss and weaken his position in the House of Representatives. Uh, so uh, I know I'm going over tomorrow to, uh, uh, tomorrow morning to talk to one of Strauss's uh, lieutenants uh, to try to find out, you know, what, what's happening in these little races around the state. They're very hard to tell, uh, uh, and in, in almost every case, uh, it, there, there's not a lot of polling out there. 
there's not a lot of, uh, of, I would say, action in terms of, of uh, you know, big, big fights shaping up. Uh, but, uh, but, but the way it's going, uh, that we, we could very well have this Republican Civil War. Uh, there's a, a group uh, called Empower Texans uh, that is uh, a very conservative group, and they are uh, trying, they in particular are motivated to defeat the Strauss uh, supporters and, and weaken him uh, so that they can have a speaker who is more to their liking ideologically. Uh, I think that's the big, that's the big fight. That was the big fight last session. And I think, it, as I said, as long as the Strauss is speaker, uh, it'll be the big fight. You know, kind of, kind of putting this together, you know, one of the things that you notice watching the Republican candidates is that it's clear watching them that they don't have a governing effect like you do in a national election. So if you watch a presidential election, the, the candidates on the left will run as far left as they think they can run, knowing that they're going to have to go back toward the middle for the November election. The candidates on the right will do the same thing, going as far toward the right as they think they can, knowing they're going to amend it later. So. They govern their behavior a little bit, keeps them inside the fences. In Texas, it's clear that the Republicans don't think the Democrats are competitive yet and are running elections in a way that tells you they don't think that there's any need to run back toward the moderates and the left. There's nothing governing their, you know, or, or throttling their ideology uh, in this election. So if you watched any of the, if you've seen any of the forums televised or not among the four candidates for lieutenant governor, for example, you know, they're running a race that is to, a little bit to the right of, um, you know, Dan Patrick's sort of in his home zone. Jerry Patterson is sort of in his home zone. Um, David Dewhurst is running as a more conservative candidate than I think he's run in other races. And Todd Staples is running somewhat as a, as a more conservative candidate than he has in past races. And they're taking some positions that, if they thought that they were in genuine trouble from Letitia Vandepute, the only Democrat in the race, in November, I think they would be minding their positions in a, in a little bit different way. Um, you know, the, to the change question, I would say, you know, there's 34 candidates at the top of the ballot in the, in the top seven races, if you include the U.S. Senate. Um, and, and that's just on the Republican side. And Republican voters right now are in this kind of conundrum. If you don't know the candidates, this isn't the kind of election where you can walk into the polling place and say red flag, blue flag, I'm a red flag, and vote that way. You have to kind of suss out, you know, what's going on with the candidates, what's going on with the groups. I think a lot of the affinity cards, the slate cards, the endorsements are going to be meaningful in a way in this election and the Republican side that they're not in ordinary elections, just because people are trying to figure out, you know, we did a, we did a story the other day on the lieutenant governor's race and had them had a piece of art with it that was four soup cans, each with a face on it. It all looked like the same kind of soup. If you're a Republican voter going to the polls, you've got a, you've got a, a discernment problem here. So. Nobody knows who these people are, really, except the people who follow it, you know, crazy close like, like we do. People with no lives. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Harvey. Yeah. So, so I mean, it, it's, they're, they're just not known. Uh, they, they don't have a following. Uh, uh, most of them are, uh, you know, their, their biggest position might be state senator. Uh, so uh, it, it's going to be very difficult to discern uh, who people are going to be voting for. Uh, you know, we have an attorney general's race with uh, three or four people in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, it'll be very hard to say who the favorite is. We, we know that. Uh, we know that Dan Branch has the most money, but uh, whether he will be able to uh, to turn that into uh, a winning strategy, uh, I don't know. He, he does have the Dallas establishment money behind him. But I think that you can go to the controller's race. Same thing. I mean, uh, 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 you know, Glenn Hagar has run the strangest race that I've ever seen, really, in, in, uh, uh, for a major position. Uh, he's running for controller, and he doesn't make any attempt to talk about what it, you know, what he would do if he were controller. So except uh, ban abortion. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, it, it, it's strange. People they don't know the people, and uh, uh, it, it's 
it, it's going to be, I think, very, very wide open uh, to, to, to get through these down ballot races. I think this, uh, this all raises a lot of interesting themes that we could go into in a lot of different directions, but I wanted to start by pushing back on a point uh, Harvey made. You, you pointed out that the Tea Party seems to do better, the Tea Party type candidates do better the bigger the jurisdiction, and uh, the establishment Chamber of Commerce type Republicans do better in local jurisdictions. And that's an interesting way to look at it, um, which actually I don't think I've heard put that way before. So I was thinking at this, it occurs to me though that the big jurisdictions, the Senate race in 2012 with Ted Cruz prevailing over David Dewhurst, um, maybe the 2010 gubernatorial reelect campaign with Perry prevailing over K. Bailey Hutchison. Um, I think you could see those in that framework um, with Perry being farther right than K. Bailey and Cruz being farther right uh, than, than Dewhurst. Um, but it's a pretty small sample set. And in that kind of context, I also think about the fact that K. Bailey had a fairly listless campaign and, and Perry was the incumbent at a time when the state's doing well. So how could we uh, why would we extrapolate that the Tea Party is strong based on based on that kind of result? Uh, actually, in the case of Cruz, that was uh, that, that was the biggest trophy I think that obviously they got that, that you could actually attribute to the, uh, the the Tea Party type. I think the uh, the, the failure of Kay Bailey Hutchison, David Dewhurst, and Rick Perry in their respective races actually had more to do with the fact that they walked on stage communicating mostly a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. You know, it was their turn. Of course, you know, Kay Bailey Hutchison was the most popular uh, politician before she became Kay Bailey Hutchison uh, and got rebranded. And, um, and I think that uh, the sense of entitlement is, if you, watching Dewhurst right now is actually one of the most fascinating things because he has really lost that sense of entitlement. And he is out there at rodeo shaking hands. He's um, uh, doing, uh, it's not a rose garden strategy anymore. He's, um, he's actually interacting with voters, showing up at forums and things like that. You voted uh, today at a South Austin HEB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> the terrible one on Old Tour? Right. <laughs> Which, after midnight, is actually one of the <laughs> most interesting costume places they voted in, in daylight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I think the, the organizing, way to, the theme of those elections was a, a sense of entitlement versus uh, uh, they turned off voters and, um, and undermined their campaigns from, from the, from the get-go. Uh, but the only kind of uh, insurgency that really worked was one where, where the primary was delayed, where uh, the candidate was running a Rose Garden campaign, he was disengaged and uh, thought he could do it all on TV, running against a guy who'd been out shaking hands and eating rubber chicken now for two years um, at anything that had a Republican in, name in front of it. And uh, um, I was actually thinking more in terms of the Texas Senate where, uh, and congressional races where Tea Party types have seemed to have been more successful. Um, uh, Louis Gohmert, by the way, was in town today looking to, to create a pack because he may run for speaker. So this is, but this is kind of interesting. I mean, this, this is a conundrum I always wrestle with. I mean, Louis Gohmert is in Congress. Um, his district, I think he shares about 70% of the voters with uh, state senator Kevin Eltyf, who's considered a conservative but thoughtful, balanced, effective conservative legislator who's been a perennial on the, the best and worst list that Paul's been working on for, for decades. Um, so you, you think about this district that's got the Gohmert voters and the Eltyf voters, and they're the same voters. It's the Republican primary. And I, um, I guess to your intuition that this is perhaps a problem we can uh, attribute to Ted Cruz, um, <laughs> that's, I, I think you, it's been funny seeing some of these campaigns because if, if Ted Cruz comes to one of these events for a primary candidate, like the next day, that's just the photo on the website. It's like, Cruz is bigger than the candidate on the homepage of the people running now to be the next Ted Cruz. Um, Ross, do you think they're do you think they're right? Is this logic correct? I mean, will the Tea Party prevail this time around? Well, I think this is the discernment problem. You know, the candidates are trying to attach themselves to something the voters know about. You know, uh, the best example of this right now, the Attorney General's race is Dan Branch, who you mentioned, uh, has the most money in the race. Dallas lawyer, uh, chairman in the House old friend of Joe Strauss's, um, classic Dallas, George Bush Republican. Um, Barry Smitherman is from Houston. He's kind of an engineer. He's an Aggie railroad commissioner. And then Ken Paxton is a social conservative from Collin County, which is one of the hotbeds of social conservative um, move, movement conservatives. And we, had, we sent a reporter up there, I guess four years ago, 
a young reporter who had never done this before and said, you know, be sure to check with the tea parties. And he called me back from Collin County in a cold panic and said, there's four tea parties up here. Um, so, so Paxton is expressing that in this election, you know, in an election where nobody knows him outside of his Senate district, with an ad that has Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz isn't actually endorsing anybody except for some judges, but there's no way you could watch this ad and come away with any impression other than that Ted Cruz is endorsing Ken Paxton. And for everybody who likes Ted Cruz, that's the association they're going to make. This is kind of what I'm getting at with associations. Candidates who can do that, you know, have the better chance of being successful. It may be that by the time you get down to the Railroad Commission race, and you're trying to figure out, you know, let me see, Malachi Boyles, and Becky Berger, and Wayne Christian, and Ryan Sitton, this may or may not mean anything to you, and you don't necessarily know which one is the Tea Party candidate? Which one has the association that you're looking for? Maybe if you knew all the way down the ballot, T, 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 or movement, 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 if they had labels on them, it's a red flag, blue flag problem. They don't have labels on them, and if you don't know the candidates, it's kind of a, a crapshoot. Well, on the, on the bigger, on the sort of the big picture, is, is do, we, do we think the Tea Party is stronger than it was in, let's say, 2010, which was the last? Election, or, do we, or do we think it, uh, it's otherwise, the Tea Party weaker? Nationally, I don't think there's any question that it's weaker, but in Texas Republican politics, apparently uh, all the statewide candidates believe that it, it, you, you may be able to win with, uh, may be able, they're the most motivated, the highest intensity voters, I guess that's the best way to say it. So you can't afford to offend the Tea Party, even if they're only going to be 35 to 37 percent of the vote. I think Ted Cruz scared the hell out of everybody. Um, you know, the 2010 election was the mid, first midterm in the Obama administration. You know, the, you know, one thing you've got to say in analyzing this year's election is that the Democrats, even if they were a, a, on even ground with Republicans and a competitive party and had spectacular candidates all the way up and down the ballot, they've got a headwind. Um, Obama is very unpopular in Texas right now, and, you know, that's a problem. But, but Ted Cruz, you know, so that was the problem in 2010. The Republicans in Texas and all over the country had a spectacular year. And then you come back in 2012, and for the most part, the Tea Party didn't do all that well on the ballot, but they did really well in that one race that everybody in the country was talking about and that you know, got all of the, the coverage. You know, the, everybody talked about the Wendy Davis bottle rocket. First bottle rocket was the Ted Cruz bottle rocket. Just sort of instant fame, instant everybody looking at it. And in this election cycle, I know you guys have run into this reporting, Cruz is a verb. You want to go out in a Republican primary and make sure you don't get Cruz. And but this, uh, this I think. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's how they talk about it. Uh, this, this may lead to part two of Paul's question about is the Tea Party stronger or weaker? I mean, that was 2012. It was less than two years ago. Um, so this is really the first big test we've had. I mean, you could argue the last legislative session was a test of the sort of Tea Party versus establishment Republicans' strength in the state. But um, what will happen if the Tea Party? type candidates are set back in this election if Paxton loses, which I think he will, if, um, in the comptroller's I'm not sure, which is, if, if Dewhurst is returned to office, um, if Cornyn, who I think clearly will prevail in his Senate race, goes back to the Senate, um, will the Tea Party take that as, an, as a genuine setback? Will they be subdued next time around, or will they be further aggravated and I, I continue harder? to think that they, that, that, that they are the most intense, but not the majority of the Republican Party. I think that there was, uh, with the government shutdown and uh, uh, people, the entire business community went through a convulsion, essentially, uh, as, uh, uh, as they realized the implications of, of this melodrama that one senator essentially was imposing on, uh, on the rest of the country. Um, but there is no organizing principle, big statewide organizing principle for, for moderates. Uh, well, that's sort of the civil war. We, we you know, you, you raise the speaker's race as, yeah. as kind of the metric, but so you look at the people who would be self-identified as Tea Party candidates in the in the, in the House this last session. They ran as Tea Party candidates. Uh, the sophomore, the freshmen arrive uh, essentially. Let's tear the place down. By the time they're sophomores, they're having to go back home and answer to their school boards and their hospital districts and their big employers and their small employers. And they start to become start housebroken, institutionalized, uh, more institutionally sensitive. Institutionalized and, is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> and the speaker's office did a fabulous job this last session of mentoring all these new 
freshmen who thought they were Tea Party folks um, and showing them how voting with the Tea Party was against the interests of their districts. So people walked in to the process thinking they were Tea Party candidates and finished on sign and die, or whenever we finished, um, uh, being much more comfortable with the institutional role, the role of the institution. The, the question about... Um, really? I, I, I don't know. It didn't, didn't look that way to me when they were trying to pass the, uh, you know, Prop 6. I mean, they had a hard time. They, but, the, but they did pass it. They got two-thirds. They, they got it, but, it, but it, it was hard. They had to go through three different votes. Right. The the actually the only or, uh, there were, the argument was not about whether we should do it the, or, or whether we should access the rainy day fund. There was a mechanism. Uh, it was it was a process vote. It was how we were going to access the rainy day fund, and that was several steps beyond where we had started the session, where the rainy day fund was supposed or the last session where the rainy day fund was uh, untouchable. And very few, of, very, was a with, with right. on the, on the very few of them went home and, and ran against the constitutional amendment. Right. You know, once they once once this was passed, I mean, right. there were some there were some skirmishes, but for the most part, most of the members went home and either worked for the passage of that constitutional amendment in November or just kept their trap shut. Right. It's hard to have a have your golf tournament to raise money uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and argue against water. <laughs> <laughs> when you've got the greens out there. Well, and at certain points, the Tea Party type members were actually just persuaded by arguments about things. And you think about Senator Donna Campbell from New Braunfels, who voted for the road funding measure because she is from New Braunfels, which if any of you are from San Antonio, as I am, you will fully appreciate why a Tea Party type senator would still support that, that mm -hmm. measure in a state growing so much. Well, she said, I voted for this because Interstate uh, 35 is a parking lot. Right. That's what she said on the floor of the Senate. And as a Tea Party, I think she went home and she, she's defending that now. So, um, Ross, the, the, the point about associations, um, it's interesting because in some ways the Republican Party brand in the state, as strong as it seems to be, is really just incredibly weak, right? I mean, one thing that has been, I guess to me, the dog that didn't bark in the night during this campaign is that there has been almost nobody on the Republican side just, just um, playing for the middle or articulating the middle and kind of creating a message about jobs and the economy and growth and success, despite the fact that that message is so readily available to a Texas Republican. In the past 20 years, when they've controlled everything, the state's done really well, we've been growing, every city's growing, the economy's doing well, all industries are growing. Um, we're seeing genuinely better outcomes on those metrics. That's a really strong suit for them. They have suits that are not that strong, but that is a strong suit, and they're not invoking that. And I guess, maybe from your point of view... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, so I mean, maybe I'm not, um, I guess on the ballot, everyone who's running as Republicans denominated as such, but there's not even anybody kind of casting and saying, I want to continue this legacy, this Texas miracle they've been talking about. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here for, you know, further immigration restrictions or further abortion restrictions and so on. The only person who's doing that is Strauss. Yes. He's the only person he neither has. Right. And he will win re-election in his primaries, um, Joe Strauss, the Speaker of the House. Um, he's been reelected before. You know, the politicians tend to emulate their stars, right? You know, the star of the party in Texas right now is Ted Cruz. And so the guy you emulate in order to succeed in a Republican primary in particular, and, you know, less pointedly, but in a, in a general election in Texas, is, is Ted Cruz. This was the best model going forward. If you, the model you're talking about, when you ask a lot of Republicans about that, they don't say Joe Strauss, they say Mitt Romney. And they say, you know, that may be where I'm most comfortable and that may be where some of my voters are the most comfortable, but as Harvey said, the most, you know, innervated, the most energized voters are the ones that are, you know, cheering Ted Cruz. And so that's where you go. I mean, if you can't say anything else about politicians, they're market oriented and they're responsible and, and they're looking at what works and that's what works right now. I, I tend to think that uh, uh, up until now, I just presumed that uh, Davis was going to get close to, could get close to 50%, uh, not necessarily pass it. And then I saw how inept and ham-fisted Greg Abbott was on the, the, the uh, Ted Nugent story this week and realized that there was more opening here than, than any of us thought. I was not covering Texas politics when uh, Bill Clements won the governorship. But I don't think anybody presumed that Bill Clements was, uh, was viable. I mean, they, uh, I think uh, Democrats were essentially taken by surprise. Paul's shaking his head. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I remember sitting there by the radio listening and thinking, Bill Clements carried Cameron County? <laughs> <laughs> John Bauer's going to be the, the senator. Is, the world yeah. has changed. Yeah. 
but the, the takeaway is that the erosion inside the Republican Party is creating opportunities for Democrats that we don't know if they can execute on or if they can, if they can capitalize on. But there are tectonic moments, and Bill Clements was a tectonic moment. There was a popular Republican president at the time. But, and there was, but there was also a civil war inside the Democratic Party that created an opportunity. Right. And, um, and so the, the parallels are suddenly I'm rethinking. <coughs> uh, we have two, two not ready for prime time, top of the ticket candidates, uh, or at least that's the message of the last month. And um, uh, that creates, uh, it's very destabilizing, which is wonderful for us. It is wonderful for political journalists. Um, I was going to say uh, briefly that we're going to do Q&A, so we'll start that after the next question. So if you guys want to start um, getting ready to, to pounce uh, with questions, just uh, be ready. We're almost there. Um, Ross, were you going to add on that? No. Or? Okay. Well, then maybe one kind of last question is that um, what do you expect? Will, is there anything that you think will happen this year um, that, that will create a lot of impact in the state that we're not really thinking about right now? I think about things like getting a new governor when Perry has been there so long that he's had so much time to wield the power of appointments and to amass executive power through executive orders. Um, Abbott, who's been very strong AG. Um, we will not have an AG who's that strong probably, certainly not that well established uh, as Abbott has been these past 10 years. Um, what, what are you guys looking at as kind of? You know, if you're, it's classically a weak governor state, right? We used to write about you know how the legislature sort of manhandles whoever the governor is and, um, doesn't pay much attention to them when they don't absolutely have to. And Rick Perry's turned that on its head. He's been governor for 14 years. I think he's two years, he'll, by the time he's finished, he'll have been governor for two years longer than FDR was president. And in that time, if you go through the executive agencies, he's been through the cycle of appointments a couple of times now. And so all of those people, you know, there's, he doesn't have to deal with any vestiges of the Bush administration and hasn't had to for a long time. And then if you look at the top of the org charts in all of the agencies, the executive director and the general counsel and the head of the communications and all the way down in any of the agencies, they're marbled with Perry people in a way that we haven't seen in Texas politics since those agencies were marbled with Bob Bullock people. And I think, um, you know, for the incoming office holders, I think they're going to be dealing with this for a long time. David Dewhurst has been the lieutenant governor since 2002. Greg Abbott's the longest serving attorney general in Texas history. And I think their successors are going to take a, a little bit of time to unwind this. And the next governor is going to be either proof that we've changed the role of the governor in Texas forever because of Rick Perry, or that we really haven't, and that he was an anomaly and it really is a weak governor system. Well, Perry has effectively established uh, a cabinet form of government right. in Texas. That's what he's done. And, uh, you know, it, it's a remarkable feat to have done that. But it, it's like a, when you're in the legislature or in the government, uh, it, it's like a monopoly board. <clears throat> you can't find a place to land on the board that's safe. And uh, from, from Rick Perry, there, there is no, there is no place. No boardwalk, no park place, no vintner garden, <laughs> No chancellor, no president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I actually think the most interesting change right now is that because of uh, Perry's domination, it has empowered what I, I you know, sarcastically refer to as the oligarch, oligarchs, the billionaires, the ones who've been financing the, the, the Republican campaigns. They're dead. Uh, three of them are, <laughs> and the rest are getting old. But uh, I, the trade associations used to essentially, the trade associations and to a lesser degree the contract lobbyists used to be the ones who kind of affected the levers of power. Now it's uh, two dozen oligarchs on the Republican side and a handful of trial lawyers on the Democratic side where they're needed. Um, I, with this whole new cast of characters, um, I, I wonder, trade associations bring grassroots to the table, oligarchs bring $100,000 checks to the table. Um, and I, I tend to think that there's a target of opportunity there for trade associations uh, and the non-oligarchs to actually reassert themselves in the process and regain some of the, the levers of power. And I, it, it's the change that you don't see, but it actually may prove to be the most important change. But is it, let me ask you something, because I, I hear this from people all the time, that, that the people who are ruining politics 
are not the oligarchs and they're, they're not the trade associations, it's the consultants. That, that's, that's what I do. Uh, and consultants are, are I, I mean, hired agents of oligarchs oh, and trade associations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but they're also independent entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, so if you're a consultant, you're a lobbyist, a public relations firm, you only have to report your, disclose your lobby fees. You don't have to disclose your public relations stuff. So I guess they are the hidden agents of the, of the, of the process. But uh, that's kind of like uh, blaming the mainstream media for you know, what's <laughs> happening under the dome. They're really the messengers more than the, uh, the, uh, the, the true agents. So let's just blame the candidates, maybe. Um, yeah, there you go. Folks, should we uh, take some questions? Sir? Yeah, Mr. Conberg has alluded a couple of times to Wendy Davis hitting potentially a, what I think of as an un unthinkable number for a statewide Democrat. Uh, and, and so, and I say that given the history of the last few years. Other right. than 90, uh, I'm sorry, 2002, the sharp Dewhurst race, and then the four-way governor's race in 2006, which I think you can explain as anomalies and having factors. But the Democratic statewide candidate hasn't come to 10 to 15, 17 points every every cycle. It's not like Dallas County where you saw the Republican margins in the county right, coming sure. closer and closer and then it flipped. Mm -hmm. what, I mean, is there, what is the quantitative uh, evidence, other than maybe just a hunch that there's some opening, is there any quantitative evidence to suggest Davis really has a chance to get close to 50%? Well, we certainly haven't seen any evidence of execution, of creating a plan and executing a plan, but we do, we do see the raw material there. And that is that uh, the organizing principles for Democrats have been unmassaged now, I guess that's a bad term, but it have been, un <laughs> sorry, have been um, un underutilized. Uh, the organizing principle of women was critical. I mean, you forget that, that in uh, 2007, the Texas House Democrats fought the Texas House to a functional tie of 76 Republicans, 74 Democrats, um, uh, which led to ultimately the overthrow of Tom Craddock and, and created some hope for Democrats that, that they had a bench team that, um, that, that ultimately was undermined by the yeah. Barack Obama. Yeah, ultimately. I think the organizing principle are women and minorities, essentially. Well, I mean, it's the Obama, the only, this is really a, tortured comparison. But the only place that the Obama coalition was tested in the last election was in Wendy Davis's Senate district, and that was women, minorities, and millennials, uh, with a little help from the downtown business community. Um, uh, yeah, it allowed the minorities to have a bigger impact. Um, is there a quantitative evidence yet? I don't think so, but she hasn't done, she hasn't, we haven't seen Hillary come down or, or any of the, uh, but, but I, think, I think the Ted Nugent thing, ironically, broke through. Um, uh, certainly, the, I, the, the, the two things that have broken through in the last month have been Wendy Davis abandoned her children, which is <laughs> not true, um, or there's no evidence of it, and, um, and the Ted Nugent, that Second Amendment probably doesn't trump child molesting. Uh, uh, so I, I think the deck is pretty well shuffled here and that uh, the Republicans are doing what the Democrats did in the days of Yarborough and Connolly and, and fractionalizing and marginalizing themselves and creating an opportunity for a bigger voice. Uh, she's going to have $25 million. She's going to have a boatload of volunteers. Um, uh, Republicans are speaking to a smaller and smaller audience. Uh, uh, constantly, and I don't know when the inflection point is, but um, but it may be. They, I said earlier tonight to somebody that it feels like the Republicans have their foot on the accelerator as they go over the cliff. Uh, it may be four years away, but uh, this primary is not is is. They're they're, they're going to go over the cliff. The, yeah. the the first sign of this, I'm I think I'm more on your side of this. The first sign of this is going to be when the Republicans look in the rearview mirror. You know, the, the remember the the. T-Rex in the rearview mirror in, in Jurassic Park, you know, objects in the mirror may be closer than they appear. When, when, when you see Republicans debating in a way that tells you that they've got an eye on November and tells you that they've got something in their own numbers, in their own metrics, in their own, you know, they're catching some vibe that there's some reason to be afraid of this other thing. Now, the Democrats will tell you, so the, the things that they're hopeful about are, you know, they got two point, Nine million people out for a very competitive race in 2008. 
2.2 um, million people of those people have never come back to the Democratic primaries. But a lot of them still vote in November elections. And so one aim of the Democrats is maybe we can get some of those people to vote, you know, in a, some of the people who vote Democratic <coughs> in presidential years to vote Democratic in a gubernatorial year, and maybe that'll change the map. The other thing is, you know, anecdotal but interesting. That was quite a bit of noise that the Democrats raised that one night in June. Is that a one-off or is that something that they can sustain and, and turn into an energetic force going forward? And, and some Democrats, you know, will tell you, you know, not a lot of them, but some of them, this is the wrong time to ask them this, but some of them will tell you, you know, this isn't really about 2014. We're building a thing for, you know, maybe Hillary runs, maybe somebody else in 2016, maybe 2018. I think three of those Democrats are named Castro and Parker. And, and, you know, looked at this situation this year and said, I want to run statewide, but not yet. I, uh, I know you guys will be shocked to find out that we do this uh, with each other. We're on panels with some, someone <laughs> regularly. So I recently heard Ross make uh, allusion to the Jurassic Park and the rearview mirror. And I got to thinking about that afterwards because I think it really is apt. But if you watch Jurassic Park, there's no sign of the dinosaur until suddenly. Well, it, that's true. It's in the mirror. Uh, although in Dallas County, there really was. I mean, Georgia. The Dallas County was, went like that. Yeah. Re elected in 2004, barely winning his unknown county. There were signs. Mm -hmm. right? Harris, Harris County is in the same place. You know, the, the big counties have all done this. Right. You know, with the exception and the suburbs. Of if you want, if you look at the voting patterns in the suburbs, you're seeing the bleeding of the Democratic trend into the suburb, the Republican suburbs. Uh, so the areas in Williamson County most juxtaposed to Austin are increasingly becoming Democratic. So there's, there's an implication here that this trend is irreversible. Um, whenever it takes effect, it's nonetheless a trajectory. Do you think if we see Abbott, for example, win, is he going to govern as a far right person, even if he has campaigned to the right, or does he just get through primary, get through a general election, take office, and stop this kind of stuff? It's a really good question, and I I think the, the most important issue right now in the campaign for the Republicans is, can Greg Abbott regain his splitting, or is this going to be repeated? In other words, and, and, and partly because he is, uh, you know, he, I mean, he doesn't, he's an unyielding person. He is not, he's not an I'm going to work with everybody kind of guy. And I think that uh, if, if Abbott does not regain his splitting, the Republicans are going to be on very dangerous ground. That what happened this week with Ted Nugent is very, very dangerous for Republicans because, more than anything else, uh, it's women who are going to be who are going to be the ones that, that are turned off by what happened. Um, there is more. Let's do uh, back row and then JJ up here. Uh, where do the gubernatorial stand on the rainy day fund? Perry put it off limits. Uh, gee, that's a policy question. I'm not sure. <laughs> <what's> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anybody's talked about policy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the we, we, we want to know who's winning the race in Fort Bend County right. for, for state legislature. Um, I don't know that it makes much difference because uh, as a freshman governor, they'll both be freshman governors, and uh, the legislative leaders, um, uh, Strauss is going to be speaker again, barring something truly uh, extraordinary. and. Um, uh, you know, Patrick will probably make noises to keep it off, off the table. But um, uh, Abbott has lousy relations with the legislature, and the Democratic, the legislature is still going to be Republican. So if Davis wins, um, you know, there's, it, it's, it's going to be great for us, but it's going to be hard to imagine what the dynamic is at this stage. It'll depend what they spend it on. You know, if the, if the legislature comes in and says, you know, we're going to have to use the rainy day fund for X school finance, whatever it is. And X is dear enough that it's dangerous politically to veto that move. I mean, this is how they've you know, overwhelmed governors before. Um, I, I think, and this kind of goes back to this organizational thing. You know, Perry's got really deep control of the government right now in a way that I don't think the next governor, at least initially, will. And that's a power shift toward the legislature. So it's really sort of a feel for what the legislature is going to do. Paul's right that the House fought like crazy about using rainy day fund and any mechanism around it for water. Um, the question is going to be this balance of, you know, the price sensitive uh, members of the legislature who are worried about taxes and fees and rainy day fund and things like that and the, and the product sensitive ones who are worried about things like roads, schools, water, and that. I mean, that's kind of the essential tension here. And if you get to a point where, you know, I really don't want to spend more money on schools, but that judge is telling me I have to. And I don't want to raise taxes and fees, but I do have this pot of money over here that I said I wouldn't get into. 
that pot's easier than those if they decided to do this. And that's the balance that, they're, that they'll be battling. And that was yesterday's battle, frankly. I, I, you know, Mike, we'll, we'll find out if Michael, there was one voice that was driving that train, essentially. And if that one voice is Michael Quinn Sullivan, Tim Dunn, Empower Texans, Texas for Fiscal Responsibility, they're all the same voice, the, the same entity. And if they are successful in this election, uh, uh, it'll make a difference. And, uh, but if they're, if, by the end of the last session, they, their capacity to move votes on the House and Senate floor were fairly limited. I'll do JJ, and then you back there after JJ, sir. So March 5th, any, what do you think the biggest surprise could be? How relieved John Cornyn is. <laughs> he's liberated. <laughs> that already Ted, happened, yeah. <laughs> he's, no, he's liberated from Ted Cruz. <laughs> On March 5th, Ted Cruz no longer wields any power over John Cornyn. Um, and, uh, if Dewhurst goes back, is he also liberated from Ted Cruz? I think uh, he's... He, he's liberated from Rick Perry. He was, he was so fearful of Rick Perry that, um, that uh, Perry's office could intimidate. He was always caught in a crossfire between his senators and the governor's office. And the senators were gonna generally have their way. Um, but it, it um, uh, kind of kneecapped him. Um, and he had very, very rocky relations inside the Senate. I don't think that Greg Abbott intimidates him. I'll say outside chance, Devin Medina for Comptroller. Uh, Ma'am? <laughs> My question was actually going to be about Dewhurst. Based on how he's running this race, do we expect to see his leadership style say the same as it was last session, or do we expect to see the old Dewhurst back? I, I think we know Dewhurst. Yeah. I think we get the same Dewhurst. Uh, as, as he was last session? Yeah, one of the things he said, and you know, you can judge for yourself whether this was a smart thing to say during a campaign, was if I win this election, I'm not going to run again. Um, so that tells you first that um, this is valedictory, and it also tells you that he's not going to feel the pressure of another election behind it. So I, I think, you know, we've watched him since 2002, and he's essentially been the same guy. I mean, there were moments when the Senate changed, and he's kind of, you know, Dewhurst is, um, I'll say this gently, but, but I think it's true. I, in some ways, he's a weather vane for the Senate. And you know the Senate changed and got more conservative this time, and Dewhurst went with the weather vane. I think if he's elected again, the next Senate promises to be a notch or two more conservative than this one. You know, the, a lot of the senators are being replaced, who are leaving, are being replaced by people who are at least or more conservative than they are. I think you know, I think Dewhurst is kind of a known quantity. Yeah, I, just, I just think for Republicans, uh, you know, demographics plays a huge part in all of this. And the Republicans are living in a fool's paradise, or rather dying in a fool's paradise, because <coughs> they're getting old. And they're, they're running out of Republicans. The factory that makes Republicans is going to shut down. <laughs> <laughs> and so and that's the problem for Republicans. Uh, I, I, talked to, I did a column uh, a couple of years ago and uh, talked to Steve Ministeri, who was the chairman of the, who was the, chairman of the Republican Party. And uh, he told me that uh, the average age of Republican donors uh, at that time was 72, and the average age of, uh, of uh, convention delegates uh, was 68. Wow. So that, that's the future. That's the future of the state. Um, it can't be changed. Maybe we time for one more quick question. Uh, I was curious about Joe Strauss. Uh, Harvey said he thought that he was going to be speaker. Does everybody think that he doesn't need to worry about all these efforts to yeah, I think, so. I think Strauss is basically like the median voter in the state. Of all statewide, he's probably the closest to that. I think he's in a very strong position um, because he's well in line with Texan norms, his district norms, state norms. Yeah. What infuriates the Tim Dunns and the Michael Quinn Sullivans of the world is that he's got the rock solid support of 50 Democrats. And so if you're going to give away chairmanships and power, uh, every speaker has 25. Uh, uh, revolutionaries that are trying to unseat them one way or the other. And uh, that's essentially what Strauss has got. They've incorporated the entire rest of the House into the leadership structure. And even if we have 15 or 20 new members, he's still got 76. So there's no, there's no bet unless there's something that is so apocryphal we can't see it coming. Which unless the Democrats go off the reservation, he's completely safe. Correct. And that's what infuriates the Republicans. They want the Republican caucus to pick, and which they did last time, actually. They did have a vote inside the Republican caucus, and Strauss got 76. 
Well, guys, um, I want to thank you all so much for being here and thank my panelists for being here, too. We're going to stick around, so if you all want to ask more questions, I'm sure you can approach any of these friendly gentlemen to do so. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you.